Hello, now looking at some moral and legal implications of IT. Of course, going through life, we should be thinking about moral and legal implications, but in an exam, say, you're gonna get given some scenarios and have to use some common sense, but also some of the theory we're going to cover in this video. So first of all, talking about not just morals, but ethics as well. So both ethics and morals are two words you've probably come across before, both are all about distinguishing between right and wrong. And all of us have our own perceptions about right and wrong, certain actions we would consider to be good, you know, being kind to someone, whereas if you are going to bully someone, most of us would consider that to be a wrong action. And that sort of society has got that view, but morality is generally to do with our personal view. So you can use ethics and morals fairly interchangeably, but generally speaking, morality is about what our own opinion is. So for example, maybe you've got a pacifist, someone who believes in peace and doesn't want to go to war at all. They may say, well, it would be morally wrong to design a computer system for the military. Maybe they've been offered a job working for the army and decide to decline the job because as a pacifist, it would go against their morals. They wouldn't want to create anything which could be used to hurt other people in a war. Whereas in a slight contrast, talking about ethics usually refers to a group or society more generally. So not just your own personal view, but a view which is kind of fairly heavily influenced by a wider group or society as a whole. So like bullying, I would it's fair to say society does not like bullying. That's not just a, a personal view, uh, generally speaking. So to think about IT, um, we have, so maybe you have a person who's a member of the British Computer Society, the BCS, which is a organization which represents people who work in the IT field in the UK. So it's kind of like a professional body, a professional group. So as a member, you may follow their ethical code. So the BCS have an ethical code, which has various points, but one of them is requiring careful use of confidential information. So you can't just disclose it. You can't just send it to third parties, to other people. So you belong to this group. This group has their own ethical code, which has kind of been decided by lots and lots of individual people. And they're sort of agreed on a set code. And one of the points might be not just sharing information with other people. So both morals and ethics do rely on opinions and our own view, but um, morality is usually individual, whereas ethics is usually a little bit of a wider decision. So going from ethics and morals to legislation, legislation is another word for a law. So a law can be thought of as legislation. Technically legislation is when it goes through a parliament, but that's not hugely important. So some immoral or unethical actions are punishable by law and some are not. So ethics and morals sometimes lines up with law, sometimes it doesn't. So for example, if someone is just being a bit unkind to you, is insulting you online maybe, on social media, that may be immoral and unethical according to most decent people, but it's not necessarily illegal, right? So if you make a slightly unkind joke, you're not going to immediately get arrested even if you maybe will feel bad afterwards. However, depending, you know, if you take this further and if someone says something which is seriously untrue about you and causes major damage to your reputation, your reputation being what people think of you, that may be both immoral and unethical, but also illegal. So some things can be just immoral, but not illegal, and some things can be both. So this is, this becomes illegal because of the legislation, the Defamation Act of 2013. And this whole process where you are, where someone is being so unkind or, or lying about someone to damage their reputation to a serious extent is called defamation of character and is illegal according to this law. When you defame someone or a company, it's when you are lying essentially and trying to damage their reputation, but to a really serious extent. It goes beyond just joking, it's deliberately trying to cause them harm. The Defamation Act isn't the only law which you need to know about. I mean, there isn't a set list, but I'm going to go through a few more which are, I think, relevant to IT and would cover all scenarios pretty much. Because you're not a lawyer, you're not expected to know these in loads of detail. I'd recommend learning the name of the law, definitely. The date doesn't matter. So this law of Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act was created, was put into law, was passed through Parliament in 1988, so quite a while ago now. Usually we write the law as an act, so it's called an act of Parliament, and usually we write the date afterwards. I wouldn't necessarily bother learning the date. Um, I'm gonna write it down just for context. But learn the, law, learn the name of the law and also the main aspects of it, which I'm going to go through. So this law, the Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act, is all about designing, it's all about protecting, I should say, intellectual property. 
shortened to IP and trying to protect it from being stolen. So intellectual property, IP, are creations of the mind, which is a very sort of wishy-washy legal term, which I imagine is hard to argue in court. But things like books, if you are creating art, things like software, so anything you are sort of creating in your mind with some creativity, that's gonna be quite hard to protect from being stolen. If you steal a laptop, that's quite easy for the police to prosecute because it's a physical device. But if it's coming from the mind, if it's a book, and it's an idea, it's a little bit harder to protect against. So this law is trying to do that. And I'm sure you've seen the copyright symbol, which is where you know it's coming from the name here, it comes from this law with this, the C and the circle around it. Also anything where it says something like all rights reserved means that the author of the IP is reserving their rights, they're not giving, they're giving it away to anyone else, it can't be stolen. So this law, the CDPA, means that you can't copy or download software or files without the creator's permission without it being illegal. And the same is true for other non-IT entities like books and art. You can't just copy a book and sell it without uh, the creator's permission. But in terms of software, in terms of IT, it means that things we are creating like software can't just be shared without permission. And so it's why you have to buy software. You can't just download it off a dodgy website. That would be illegal. And often this is managed with software licenses. So you buy some software, you get a license, maybe you get a code which you enter into the software and activates your account and enables you to use the software properly. And the usual punishment for the CDPA is a fine. Whereas the Computer Misuse Act from 1990, a couple of years later, can lead to a jail sentence. Not a long one, usually in the UK. In America and other countries, you can go to jail for a long, long time for doing something like hacking or creating malware. In the UK, you can go to jail, but usually it's not quite as severe. So as opposed to the CDPA, which is more about stealing stuff, this is more about actually the act of trying to hack into a system, trying to distribute malware and so on. So we're thinking more about the black hat hackers here, the white hat hackers are not, it's not illegal because they have permission. Here it's where you have no permission. So the CMA makes it illegal to access computer systems without permission of the owner of that system. So you can't just hack into a system, you have to get permission, otherwise it is illegal according to this law. You also can't just impair a system. So, you know, if you're hacking into it, you may just be trying to steal information. But you can also damage a system, right, with hacking, maybe with a DOS attack. If you are spamming a system to try and stop it working, that is said to impair the system, is to stop it working properly. Maybe even the system stops working totally. And that is also illegal according to this law. The Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974 is a bit less dramatic than the Computer Misuse Act. This is more just about making work spaces safe for employees, which is important. I mean, IT jobs don't tend to be in particularly dangerous situations. If you work in a factory where lots of moving parts, maybe that is quite dangerous. But if you're in an office, which is where most IT workers work, the same risks do not apply. Here, the risks are things like not having enough breaks. As an employer, you have to provide enough rest breaks. You can't just force an employee to sit at their computer all day. Also, you need to make sure any equipment like screens and chairs are safe for long continued use. If you've got a screen which is really dim or really small or is far away, it could cause issues with the employee's eyesight. Also, a chair is quite important if you're getting them to sit on a really old, uncomfortable chair. That could cause some health issues. And so employers do have a responsibility under this law to make sure that workspaces are safe enough and comfortable enough for employees. And because IT workers are going to work in situations with electricity and loads of wires and potentially, potentially some dangerous equipment, also of course that needs to be made safe. Um, it's why electrical equipment will, will often get tested uh, every couple of years and you'll get a sticker put on it to make sure it's safe. That sort of thing would be covered under this law. And the final law, the final piece of legislation I want to talk about is the Data Protection Act. A really important one which was last updated in 2018 as I record this. So it was an older version but um, it hasn't significantly changed. And this is designed to protect personal data from misuse as the name would suggest. So this is the UK's implementation of the European Union law, the GDPR, which you may well have heard about. The GDPR was a reason why lots of websites nowadays always ask you for your permission to accept cookies and various other things. It can be quite annoying sometimes, but it's all based on this law. And the DPA is the UK's version of GDPR. So we should say what personal data is. We know what data is, just a raw fact or figure. Information is where we add some meaning to it. 
Personal data is information which can be used to identify a person. So if we can look at some data, or really it'll be information in that case, and know who it belongs to, that would be personal data. So your name, your address, and also other more sensitive personal data, which is protected even more, are things like biometric data, so your fingerprint maybe, that's really valuable. Health data, so maybe your medical history. Your beliefs, like political or religious, that's quite private. Your ethnicity, that's quite important. You don't want people to know that necessarily. Things like your sexual orientation and so on. So things which are definitely identifiable to us, but things we don't want companies to, we want them to take special care with because they are so private to us. Your name and your address is fairly personal, but is not nearly as sensitive as things like your sexual orientation. And this law is very, very extensive, and so we're not gonna go through all of the points, just the key points, the things which organizations must do to protect individuals. So they must inform individuals that their personal data is being used and how it's being used. That's why we get those messages on websites saying, do you accept us collecting this, this, and this? Most people don't read it, but technically that is a website informing you that your data is being used and you must consent to your data being used. So they can't just assume you are accepting, like they used to be able to, you have to actually click a button or give your permission to have data collected about you. You can also, as an individual, you can request access to see what personal data an organization stores about you. So if you wanna know what Facebook store about you or Google or YouTube, you can technically contact them and they need to provide the data to you if you wanna know what they're storing about you. And also, somewhat related to this, you can have your data deleted, which is quite important. If you decide actually you don't want Google to have data about you, you can ask Google to delete it and they need to delete it under the law. You can also update it. Maybe things have changed and you want to update your information or maybe you want to move it from one service to another. Maybe you want to move your data from Facebook to Twitter. Technically, you can request that. And the punishment for organizations not following these steps, not following the law, is usually very, very large fines can be millions and millions of pounds in some cases, so there is a big incentive for companies to follow the law in this case.